Well, I invite you to grab a pew Bible from in front of you if you would like to, or if you perhaps brought a Bible with you, you may go ahead and open that up to our scripture reading for this morning. We are continuing in the book of Colossians, and we are up to Colossians chapter uh, 3, verses 12 through 17. Uh, Just a way of reminder, I'm reading from the English Standard Version you have in your pews, the New International Version, just a few differences in wording and phrasing if things sound a little bit different. Hear the word of the Lord. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of, God, of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God God, indeed. Well, as I said this morning, we are continuing our fall sermon series, Colossians, all because of Jesus. That's something that we all say, we all think, we all believe that everything is because of Jesus, but... We don't often take time to think through both how profoundly true that is and the practical implications of what that means for us and for our lives. It's, easy, it's one of those things that's easy to say, uh, but also easy to miss the bigger picture of what we mean when we say that. And that's what Paul wants to make sure we don't miss in this letter to the Colossians. He wants to make sure that we know exactly what is because of Jesus and how profoundly true that is and the amazing, incredible impact that should have on our lives. Last week we saw that it is only when we are heavenly minded that we are able to be any earthly good. In our passage last week, Paul refers uh, to the earthly things in us, uh, sexual immorality, lust, anger, wrath, greed, slander, and whatnot. He refers to these things as the old self that we should have, that we should take off. That old self is like the grimy, dirty, sweaty, smelly clothes that you wear for yard work and cleaning the gutters. But he's imagining that those are the clothes that you'd been wearing your entire life until Jesus showed up and found and redeemed you, until you were filled with Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul says that that we've put off that old self. We've taken off those nasty, grimy, gross old clothes and practices. Instead, in verse 10, he says that we've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. If our character might be considered the clothing of our inner nature, then the question that we should be asking is, what does our character reveal about the inward truth of our relationship with Jesus Christ? As we look at our passage this morning, we will see that the clothing of our character reveals the reality of Christ in us. I am sure that you have heard the expression, the clothes make the man. Right? Have you heard that at some point in time? The premise behind this statement is is that how we dress affects how people look at and perceive us. Now, we tend to chafe at the idea of other people deciding what to think of us based on our clothing these days. People shouldn't judge me based on how I dress. I should be able to dress however I want. People shouldn't judge you for that, right? That's, that's something that we all often think. But the simple truth is that as human beings, we are wired to judge a book by its cover. Whether we should or shouldn't, it's really kind of besides the point. We all do. 
whether we like it or not, how we choose to dress does in fact make an impression on those around us. But what's really interesting is that how we dress also affects how we see ourselves. Several years ago, a uh, study was done in which a group of researchers gave two groups of people, two groups of graduate students, the exact same white coats to wear and asked them to complete a series of cognitive tasks. One group was told that the white coat was a doctor's lab coat. The other group was told that it was a painter's coat. The results? Those who believed they were wearing a lab coat made half as many mistakes as those who believed they were wearing a painter's coat. Isn't that interesting? How we dress, or how we think we're dressing, affects how we perceive ourselves. How we choose to dress not only affects what others think about us, but it also affects how we see ourselves. Frankly, this is something that I experience on a regular basis, as I'm sure most of you know about the only time that you'll see me wearing a suit is on a Sunday morning or during the week if I happen to be officiating a wedding or a funeral or we're operating in some kind of a official ministerial capacity. I have just never really been a suit and tie kind of guy. In fact, a almost daily occurrence in our house occur occurs when I'm getting ready to leave for work. As I'm heading out the door, my wife will say, you're not going to work, are you? To which I will say, well, yeah. I mean, why, why would you ask that? She goes, well, because you look like you're going fishing or hiking. To which I go, huh, what do you know? And head on out the door on my merry way. Apparently, my wife doesn't seem to think that wearing shorts, a Columbia PFG shirt and sandals is appropriate work attire for a pastor. And as loath as I am to admit it, she's probably closer to the right side of that argument than, than I am. Although that hasn't really changed my daily attire all that much. But this is what I do know. When I put on a suit, when I dress up like this, I carry myself differently. I find that I tend to stand a little bit straighter. I walk with a little bit more confidence in my step. I speak a little bit more boldly just because of the change of attire. Frankly, even at 46 years old, I still feel just a little bit more grown up when I wear a suit. How we dress affects how others see us, but it also affects how we see ourselves. One of the primary analogies, as we talked about a moment ago, that Paul uses in chapter 3 of Colossians is that of taking off old, grimy, dirty clothes and putting on the new, clean, pure clothes that Christ has made for us. The way he describes these clothes makes clear that he's, he's not talking about garments, at all. He's talking about character. He's basically saying that our character reveals the state of our inner being, our, our hearts, our souls, so to speak. The old clothes are clothes of anger, malice, wrath, slander, and obscene talk. They are clothes that are full of lies, and they're covered in impurity, idolatry, covetousness, and sexual immorality. Does that sound like clothes that you want to put on? It's like getting dressed for work on Tuesday morning and putting on your grimy, nasty, dirty, sweaty yard work clothes that have been sitting in a heap on the floor since Saturday when you were out working in the yard. And that's just gross. Paul basically said to take those clothes and burn them. You used to wear those nasty things, but not anymore. You used to be that way, but that's not who you are now. Now you are filled with Christ in you. Now you can put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Christ has put together a brand new suit, a suit that is tailor-made just for you, And it's a suit that changes not just how others see you, but how you see yourself. 
This is a suit that reflects and reveals Christ in you, the hope of glory, to the world around you. One might summarize the entire letter to the Colossians so far this way. In chapters 1 and 2, Paul lays out for us the inner spiritual reality of Christ in us, which is the Holy Spirit. Then, in the beginning portion of this chapter, through what we've read today, Paul says that this inner reality, Christ in us, transforms our character. And then from this point on, the rest of the letter will show how our transformed character changes our behavior. This, it is this new set of character clothing that Paul lays out for us this morning. Our passage begins, Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. These, brothers and sisters, are the clothes of the Holy Spirit. They are the, the virtues of the kingdom of God. Think about these virtues in contrast to the description of the old self we just talked about. Which kind of person, if you had a choice, which kind of person would you choose to be around? Now, sometimes we might find ourselves having a tendency to mock those who are compassionate, kind, humble, meek, and patient. But aren't those also the people that we most enjoy being around? There's a couple of points that are worth making about this list of kingdom virtues. First, don't mistake these traits with merely being nice. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with being nice, and I think we should strive to be nice people, but these traits are far deeper and more meaningful than simply being nice to others. In fact, it's a lot harder to live out these traits than it is to just be nice to folks. I wish that's what Paul said. Just go be nice to people. What do you mean? Whatever. Just be nice. That'd be great. But that's not what he said. We all know how hard it can be to genuinely forgive someone who has wronged us. It can sometimes take an enormous amount of effort to be compassionate and patient. As N.T. Wright says, it takes serious prayer and real moral effort. And people who engage in that effort tend to be people who are also capable of taking difficult decisions and engaging in challenging activities in other spheres as well. Christian behavior, in other words, makes you more human, not less. Secondly, note that these are a package deal. Like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, it's pretty much all or nothing in this case. You don't get to pick some of these virtues and ignore the rest. You know what, today, today I think I'm going to put on kindness, patience, and forgiving others. But I'm going to let somebody else be humble, meek, and compassionate. That's, that's just really not my thing. I just don't do that. It's not how this works. Like a match suit, you can't mix and match what makes up the virtuous clothing of the Holy Spirit. Some days, some of these character traits might be harder to live out than others, but every day, we are all called to be all of this. Again, to the words of N.T. Wright, For any of the parts to make sense, they, need, they all need to be in place. Remind yourself that to be tender-hearted doesn't mean being sentimental. That being kind doesn't mean being a soft touch. That humility isn't the same thing as low self-esteem. That meekness is not weakness, but is what you get when a powerful wild horse has been tamed. All of the same power, but now under control. That large-heartedness doesn't mean letting everyone do what they want with you. Don't let people scoff at the central virtues that make the Christian life what it is supposed to be. The most important article in the virtuous clothing of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, is love. He writes, And above all these, put on love, 
which binds everything together in perfect harmony. L love is the jacket that pulls the entire suit together. Without love, what is compassion? How can I be genuinely humble if I don't have love? Is it not love that calms my spirit so that I can exercise patience with others? Can someone be truly kind to someone else without love? Is it even possible to freely and gladly forgive someone else if we don't have love? Was it not Christ's love that held him on the cross when he purchased our forgiveness? It was his love, it is his love in me that enables me to forgive. As Paul writes to the Corinthians, no matter what we do, no matter how much faith we have, if we don't have love, we have nothing. If we don't have love, then the entire suit of clothes begins to unravel and it falls apart. As the Apostle John writes, we love because he first loved us. And when we embrace how fully loved we are by Christ, then loving others becomes a natural and easy thing for us to do. And that's the repeated refrain throughout these verses. Christ we forgive because Christ forgave us. We love because Christ loved us. And it is Christ who enables us to put these clothes on in the first place. So how do we put these clothes on? How do we put on the virtuous clothing of the Holy Spirit? Paul continues in verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. First, we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. The key to letting Christ's peace rule in our hearts is trust. Trust is, trust is so easy to say, and it is so hard to do. But that is the central essence of the gospel of the Christian life. We trust Christ. No matter what, in all things, whether good or bad, we let go of our need to control, to understand, to direct, to be in charge. And instead, we trust. Even, perhaps especially, when we can't see the next step. Even when it seems the, the world of our life is about to end. We trust. We trust because Jesus Christ has proven himself trustworthy. Secondly, we let the word of God dwell in us richly. Trust becomes easier the more we read, know, and meditate on the word of God, allowing others to teach and admonish us, and teaching and admonishing others is but one form of letting God's word dwell in in you. I, I hear so many times from people who walked with Christ for years, sitting in Sunday school classes. It's when they turned and became a teacher themselves, when they started teaching others the Bible, maybe one-on-one -on -one in a mentoring relationship, or teaching a class themselves, that they started understanding more than they'd ever learned before. We need others to teach and admonish us. We also need to teach and admonish others so that the word of God dwells in us richly. But that's not the only way the word of God dwells in us richly. Paul says that singing hymns and songs is a way for the word of God to dwell in us. The word of God through song enters our hearts and our souls in a different way, and the roots grow down deep through the singing of that, those songs. When we remember what God has said and done in the past, we are able more confidently to trust God in the present, which allows us to live in Christ's peace. Thirdly, we seek to do all things in word and deed in the name of Jesus Christ. 
To do something in someone's name is to represent them, to say that what we are doing is what this person would say or do. How much would we change in our lives if every paragraph we wrote ended with, in Jesus' name? Would your social media posting change at all if at the end of every social media post or tweet you put, in Christ's name, amen? What about your actions? What about the things that you do? Would you have to make significant changes to your behavior if every single act was completed with this action done on behalf of Jesus Christ? Driving down the highway, somebody makes you mad, you tailgate them for 10 minutes and finally get an opportunity to cut them off. In Jesus' name, brother. I cut you off in Jesus' name. Really? I don't think that's how that works. At least that's not how that's supposed to work. The fact is that by claiming to be a Christian, you are claiming to be a little Christ, which means that everything that we say, everything that we do, is done in Jesus' name. We quite literally are his ambassadors, and the people around us will judge Jesus based on what we say and do. All of us, not just the pastor, all Christians. And I don't want to say that to guilt or shame you, but to impress the truth upon you. If my saying that brings up feelings of guilt or shame, I encourage you this week to take time to pray about that. Lay that at the foot of the cross. Take it to Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to convict you. And in the, conve- in the confession and conviction, transform you as well. It's interesting to note that letting the peace of Christ rule our hearts results in being thankful. And that allowing the word of Christ to dwell in us richly brings thankfulness in our hearts to God. And that when we do all things in word and deed in the name of the Lord Jesus, we end up giving thanks to God the Father as well. It's not anecdotal, it's essential. The life of faith lived through the Holy Spirit, filled with Christ in us, given by God the Father, is one that abounds and overflows with thanksgiving and with gratitude. As Christians, thankful is our being. It's what we are. Thankfulness is what we have. And it's what we do. We give thanks to God. The character with which we live our lives reflects the reality of the inner being to the of our inner being to the world around us. And as Christians, we are called to put on the virtuous character of the kingdom of God. When we do so, we reveal how much we are filled with Christ in us. As long as we are on this side of glory, it is always going to be a process. Sometimes we're going to be filled with more of our more of Christ and our character clothes will shine with his glory and his life. Sometimes we slip and we do put on those old character clothes as nasty and grimy as they are. You all know how it is. Sometimes there's just nothing quite as comfortable as that pair of sweatpants you've had for 20 years. But that's just not right anymore. It never quite fits the same. And every time Christ is right there to help us peel those ratty clothes off and dress us in the Holy Spirit once again. As we move into this week to come, may we be intentional in putting on the new clothes of the kingdom of God that shine with Christ's glory so that others may see Christ in us in all that we say and all that we do. Amen. Would you please take a moment and pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for your love and for your grace. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that is at work within us, remaking us each and every day, taking off those ratty old clothes of our old nature and covering us once again in your clothes and in your spirit. Lord God, we pray that you would continue to draw us along the way, faithfully following your Son, Jesus Christ. 
Would you continue to teach us the path of trust so that your peace will rule in our hearts? Would you settle your word deeply in our hearts and in our souls so that we would know you more fully? And would all that we say and all that we do, Lord, be for you and for your glory, whether it is done in this building or anywhere we go, so that we can wear your clothes proudly and shine brightly so that all may come to know the hope and life found only through your Son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.